Hey class. So um, before we start, hopefully you've already gone ahead and completed this assessment and you actually understand it and have asked questions if you don't. Um, it's really important actually that you understand this basic concept of moments before moving on with this assignment. Um, again, if you haven't solved problem one and two and gotten it correct, if you haven't done the practice quiz assignment on Google Classroom, um, and submitted that already. Um, and I'll try to give feedback as quickly as possible. Please do that first, um, because it's going to be really important to understand this concept of beam analysis. I'm going to go, uh, so you're seeing me to, right now instead of my, um, what do you call it? Doc camera. Sorry, it's late. I'm kind of tired, but felt like making this video. Uh, so one of the things I wanted to do is I wanted to go over what we're doing today. So just so you guys understand, in the last assignment, 321, uh, what we did specifically was we designed the roof deck, um, which was going to be a span, like a sheet of metal, corrugated metal, that was going to rest on this roof up here. We then selected these K truss beams to support that deck. Now that's very typical that we use trusses on roof decks. Uh, the way trusses work is, we learned this in POE as well, is that they are able to displace the load in a way where each individual member feels either compression or tension, uh, which is good for you know any member as opposed to what the beam is gonna feel right now. And uh, it displaces it across the different members. We've covered this pretty, you know, pretty fully in POE but that's what a truss does. Now what we're gonna do is we're gonna focus on this member here. So in this situation, this would be called a girder. A girder is a beam, it's a, it's a description of a beam. It's specifically supported by the columns. Uh, so eventually the load is gonna displace to the columns and then from the columns, it's eventually gonna work its way down all the way to the floor. In regards to the, um, the connection points here, you'll notice that the truss or this you know, what we're going to call a beam is connected to the girder. It's typically welded um, or, you know, mechanically fastened in some manner. It has to be mechanically fastened in some manner for the load to displace to the edges. This is where the reaction forces um, come from for the beam. However, for the girder, you're going to notice that it is now, you know, taking on the load of these girders here. So, what are we doing today? Well, we're going to talk about beams and different scenarios that it could be under, um, uh, you know, several combinations of loads that it could be under. And so we're going to go over all those things. So let's just jump right into it. Um, again, sorry about this video. It's probably going to be a little longer. There's a lot of content here without being able to do a lesson on it. Um, I'm just going to ask you to buckle down and listen, try to, you know, not put me on mute and just go through it. I will try to move as quickly as possible, but it is a content heavy uh, lecture. All right, beams. So we've talked about beams. We understand that it's gonna act different than uh, truss in the sense that because it's not in a tr because it's not in a triangular form, the load is not being displaced uh, in either compression or tension, but instead it's being loaded perpendicularly, which is gonna cause this to wanna bend. Um, in addition, um, we're going to learn about a new concept called shear. So uh, in my last video, I said I'd get back to that. Um, so here it is. So shear is what occurs on beams. So any member that is being perpendicularly loaded, which a beam would be, is going to experience what we call a shear force or shear reaction. Um, so instead of being uniaxially, like, or instead of being loaded in this parallel direction as the beam itself, so when I compress it, I'm still pressing in the direction of the horizontal member of the, you know, the axis, the main axis. Um, same when I tension, but when I shear, it means that I am now creating a force up or down. This is the same concept of why I would break a pencil if I, you know, put a up and down force on it, um, as opposed to compression or tension, which I can still technically break a pencil, but how? what's the easiest way to break a pencil? To shear it. And so um, what's our goal for this activity? Our goal is to create a shear and bending moment diagram. Now we're gonna get into that, but um, I also wanna talk about one more concept. So I'm gonna skip this because I talked about it in the last one. All right, this drawing here, 
Uh, this is going to be a new concept for you. So there is a inherent weight of materials, a dead load. Um, and so material itself carries weight. So you have to account for the fact that every material has weight. And so that weight is uniformly distributed across the beam. And so we've always kind of dealt with beams with this point load. We call that a concentrated load or a point load. So right here, um, I don't love that they did this because a lot of people don't know this. They just expect you to understand this. Whenever you see a hashtag in, in engineering, that means um, pounds, okay? So what this problem right here is saying that there is a beam that is 20 feet long, very similar to our last problem, right? That is experiencing two different types of load conditions. One load condition is a point load of 4,000 pounds, and that is being placed six feet from the point A. Okay, that makes sense. That's a beam. There's some kind of heavy piece of equipment that's going to sit there permanently, 4,000 pounds, easy. Now, there's a uniform load, which means that there is basically a weight that's distributed across a very specific area. And we're going to say it's very specifically uniform load, distributed load. So that's the right terminology, uniform distributed load, because it's possible that there could be a, a load, but that it's not, uh, sorry, a distributed load that's not uniform. So maybe there's more material in one area than another. You know, that happens all the time. But this is a uniformly distributed load. What is it saying? It's telling me that um, for every one foot of the beam, there's 650 pounds on it. So how do we even start with the reaction forces, right? Like this is a completely different scenario than you explained to me, Mr. Menge, where you didn't ask me to ever you do a uniform load. It's actually not really that much harder. That's why I feel like you have to understand the previous section to even begin to grasp this concept. All we do with that uniform load is we, um, create an equivalent point load. What that means is we say, if this 650 pounds per foot was equivalent to one load, what would its magnitude be and where would it be placed? That's kind of it, right? It's kind of like saying like, um, very similar to like our center of gravity, even though, you know, I lay down and my weight is distributed across you know, a lot of feet, I guess. Um, I have a center of gravity where I can say my point load exists. That's really no different than this. So what are we going to do? Well, we're going to sketch free body diagram, very similar to before. Now, um, we're going to go through this again. There is no lateral force. So we can assume f of x is equal to zero. We don't assume it. We can prove it. Now, what we're going to do is the following. Um, and this is Kind of the only difference. So first we want to determine the magnitude of that uniform load. Well, it's really simple. If there's 20 feet in the beam and we're saying there's 650 pounds across the 20 feet, then the equivalent magnitude of that force is 13,000 pounds, 650 pounds per foot times 20 feet. Straightforward because it's pointing down, we're saying it's negative, but then, you know, it moves over in the calculation. And so this is the first linear equation we have. Great. Doesn't help us because we don't know specifically what A and, you know, what I call Ray and Ruby. This one says FYA, FYB. I don't like saying it that way. I think it's funner to say, or more fun to say Ray and Ruby. Now, how do we solve this problem? Well, now we said that there was an equivalent 13,000 pound load on the beam. So how do we approach this now? So where would that point load be? Well, just like our center of gravity, because that's distributed uniformly across the entire 20 feet, now it would be different if it was distributed across 10 feet, right? Then it'd be in the middle of 10. But because it's uniformly distributed across the 20, that point load is equivalently right in the center. So you treat it just like, you basically imagine like the uniforms the load isn't there for the time being, and then you place it in the center because of the center of wherever, you know, whatever the middle of that uniform load was, and then um, solve the formula just like normal. We get FYB equals 7,700, which if we go back to the previous calculation, tells me that FY is 9,300. Okay, perfect. Now, are we done with the problem? No, it feels only that simple, right? 
So now we have to calculate and create a shear moment diagram. Now this concept is one that I'm going to present in my open office hours tomorrow. Um, and, uh, you know, follow along with this video, but I really want you guys to ask questions. Almost rewatch this video multiple times because I want to make sure you guys understand this. Now, this is what the shear moment diagram is. I want you to take that for a second and really kind of process it, right? Unfortunately, I don't have my document camera that I'm going to work. I can't, I can't do one or the other video. I can't like switch between the two um, right now, but what I can tell you is the following. What a shear diagram tries to tell me is what is going on internally within the beam at every single point of the beam along the way? Because it's really important to understand that you're only as strong as your weakest link. Just because there's a load, let's say, not in the middle, but right here on this beam, doesn't mean the entire beam is having the same reaction. Um, like there is going to be a very different reaction at this specific point of the beam. If this is where the load is going on, then a uh, part of the beam that's five feet away, six feet, 10 feet, 12 feet away, each section, if I were to like cut each slice of the beam, each section is experiencing a very unique shear force internally within the beam. The reason why I say you're only as strong as your weakest link is because it's really important to understand that, you know, 95% of your beam could feel hardly any shear, hardly any bending. Problem is if there's 5% that feels a, a lot and you didn't account for it, then you're in trouble. So we always gotta be concerned with what's the maximum shear the beam's gonna experience? What's the maximum bending moment that the beam's gonna experience? So let's take a look at this and try to understand how the heck a shear diagram is created. So what happens is the following. We start with a horizontal line. Okay, that's here, right along here. When we do that horizontal line across here, and let me see if I'm um, at least able to point. Yeah, when we look at this horizontal member here, sorry, we're just drawing a horizontal line. We're also drawing lines that are, you know, down the line of the beam. I always like to line them up. I don't like that this problem didn't line them up specifically, but whatever. Then we say, okay, we first start at zero because technically at the very, very, very edge of the beam, there's like, you can technically say there's like no force, right? But then as soon as we start, the like the first cell, the first atom of that beam, right? All of a sudden, experiences positive 9,300 up. Why? Well, because if there's a reaction force here, right, and it's pushing up with 93 pounds, and we just solved for that. That's what uh, Ray was, right? If it's pushing up with 9,300 pounds of force, what that tells me is that, you know, if I exclude everything else that's going on in the beam, all that that very first left section is feeling is the only force it's feeling is 9,300 up. So I'm going to draw that here. Then as I start moving down the beam, so I'm going to slide my paper across. Well, it felt 9,300 up, but then now as soon as I start getting into my beam, every foot I'm experiencing a downwards force of how much? 650 pounds foot per foot. So this slope right here is actually 650. So it's 9,300, one foot, minus 650, minus 650, minus 650, minus 650, minus 650, until it hits six uh, foot six. Um, so that's actually this point right here. At foot six, which is equal to 30, you know, 3,900, it actually has dropped down from 9,300 all the way down, you know, to right here. Um, what is that? 9,300 minus 3,900. That's 5,400. Let's say 5,400. Then not only is there a distributed load, but all of a sudden it feels a 4,000 pound drop. 
So all of a sudden, there's a 4,000 pound drop because of this point load. And then it continues on its way, minus 650, minus 650, minus 650, minus 650, all the way until it gets to negative 7,700. But if this was you know, not static, well, what does it mean to be static? It means that all the forces counteract to zero. So what happens here? Well, it shoots back up to zero. Why? Because it's negative 7,700, but then there's a positive 7,700 up, which shoots it back up to zero. So it starts at zero, shoots immediately up to 9,300, slopes down at 650, drops down because of the point load, then continues downwards at 650, and then it hits negative 7,700 before jumping back up to zero. I'm going to tell you, this is the most complicated problem we're going to see. The problems in the equations are actually, you know, this is the maximum level of difficulty. So if you can understand this example, then you're golden, honestly. Now, that was just the shear diagram. What about the moment diagram, right? The shear diagram, this tells me that, just so you guys understand, that means that the maximum shear on this beam is at the very left edge, which tells me that, oh, crap, like, I could literally rip off a part of this beam because there's so much upwards force that's not being counteracted in the downwards force that this beam is feeling a lot of upwards force in the reaction, in the reaction portion, which is, you know, you got to be mindful of. We also, now this is, for those that are in calculus, someone would say like, oh, okay, well, then is the reaction point the most dangerous point? Well, there's actually something even just as dangerous going on. By providing these reaction forces that are up, and then a downwards force that's in the middle, right? What's happening? Well, now you are bending the member. So that's why we have to then solve for, you know, the reason why they solve for all these points along the graph is because they eventually want to create something that looks like that, the moment diagram. How would they potentially even solve the moment diagram? Well, what they do is they're going to, and this is one way to do it, right? Um, you're going to go ahead and calculate the area underneath the curve. Now, for anyone that's taking calculus, you would hopefully say, oh, area underneath the curve. I've heard of something like that. Isn't that what we call an integral? That's exactly right. An integral, so this is for calculus talk now, is the area underneath this curve. So if I were to break this down into functions, which I easily could, this is just a linear function, or it's a combination of several linear functions. If I were to break this down into linear functions, then what I would be able to do is calculate the area underneath the curve. And someone says, well, I'm not in calculus. Yeah, but you know basic shape. You know the areas of a triangle. You know the area of a rectangle. Can I solve the area underneath A, B, and C? Truth is you can. And you're going to get 45,605. Now, this means that at the point it crosses zero, which is, again, right here, I actually experienced the maximum amount of moments. So there's two things that I realized. There's two danger points, right? One is where the react or the shear force is the greatest. The other, uh-oh, is where the bending is the greatest. And those are, oh, well, those are always two separate points. When we, we are eventually going to use this data, we're not even using it yet. We're going to use this data in order to later on select a beam that will meet code requirements. And in code, we actually have to follow along certain guidelines. And this is going to help us in part of the process, which we're going to see later on in a future activity. All right. So for now, what I want you to do is think of this problem. I'm going to go ahead and do this problem in my open office hours tomorrow. I hope you guys are there to see it. Otherwise, I'll see you guys, um, you know, via Zoom in the next couple of days. And I'll be using this one as an example um, and doing the shear moment diagram in my uh, live streams. All right. I know that that's what my answer is going to be, but I'll go over how I'm going to solve for all this stuff. All right. Perfect. Take care. I'll see you guys.